Well, the front of the bulletin has the verse 28.6. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Last week I was in a phone conversation with a man uh, in another state. We are talking about a very powerful, he was a Christian. But after being a Christian for about 40 years, he, he had a, another powerful experience with the Lord, and the Lord really changed him. And so I asked him a simple question at the end of that conversation. I said, so tell me, what's changed? What's changed? And that one question launched us into this long, very meaningful, very powerful conversation. What's changed since that day? What's changed since you had that experience with the risen Lord? And that's the question I want to ask each of us this morning. As we think about the resurrection of Christ, so what's changed since that day? What's changed because of that day? What has changed because Christ arose, because this scripture is true? What's changed? You know, the, the world lets the resurrection of Christ pass by without much notice. It's not like it's Super Bowl Sunday, really. There's a party here and there. Even in our neighborhood yesterday, there was a, our little cul-de-sac, two little cul-de-sacs. They had a party and everybody gathered and they, they, had, a, they had an egg hunt, over 2,000 eggs. Families will get together this afternoon here and there for a meal. Some people will get new outfits. Some kids will get some chocolate. There's even a, an acknowledgement of, about springtime and, and words like renewal and new life, a little hat tip to that. But by and large, the unbelieving world looks at today as though it's just another holiday and not even really a holiday, not even a really a big holiday because we don't even get an extra day off, Right? Everybody gets the weekend off anyway. So what's changed? Everything. Some people know it. And some people don't. And that's a whole other sermon. But I want to come back to that at the end of this one. Some people know it and some people don't. Almost a third of the world claims to be a Christian, at least give lip service to that fact that, that Jesus died and rose again. 2.3 billion people. It's the largest still religion in the world. Close second, in case you're wondering, is Islam. 1.9 billion, 21 or 25% of the people. We've got 31% of the people. Number three, surprisingly, is agnostic atheism or no religion at all. Secularism is now number three. 15% of the world claim that. Right now we're getting close to 50% of the United States. But 2 billion people believe that Jesus lived, that he died on the cross as payment for sin, and on the third day he arose. So what? What changed? The other two-thirds of the world either doesn't know about it, doesn't believe it, or doesn't care. What's changed? Well, let's look, at, let's look at some cultural differences to start with. If there were no resurrection, there would be no Christians and no churches, right? And there's even a, a part of the population that thinks that would be a good thing. If there were no Christians and no churches. And that part of the population is growing, actually. But is that true? If there was no resurrection, would there be no church? Would there be no Christians? Will there be no real church and there be no real Christians? That's for sure. There was a man in the first century, a man who was a teacher, a part of the Pharisees and a part of the, the, uh, the Sanhedrin. His name was Gamaliel, and he said something in Acts chapter 5, verses 34 through 39. Do you have that one? Uh, they were talking about what to do with these Christians. They're, 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 <laughs> they're upsetting the apple cart. They're making everybody uh, crazy. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, that was Paul's teacher, by the way, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and, and ordered them that the men be put outside for a little while. That's Peter and John that they had them put outside. They, they had called to say, why did you heal this guy? Here's what he said. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men, these Christians. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared, claiming to be somebody. And about 400 men rallied to him, and he was killed, stayed in the grave. All of his followers dispersed, and it all came to nothing. 
Then after him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census, and he led a band of people in revolt, and he too was killed, stayed in the grave, and all of his followers were scattered. Therefore, in this present case of this guy named Jesus and what these guys are saying, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You'll only find yourself fighting against God. That's wisdom. If Christ did not rise, Jesus would be proven false, a liar, and nothing more than a cult leader. And in the words of Gamaliel, Christianity would come to nothing. There were no resurrection, there'd be no Christians, there'd be no churches, and because there were no Christians and no churches, there would also be no or almost no medical care, orphanages, disaster relief organizations that help with floods and fires and hurricanes and tornadoes, homeless shelters, alcohol and drug addiction programs, feeding centers, they would be almost non-existent. And I know some would argue with that and say, oh no, there are, there are other groups that, that would do good things. There are, there are governments that would do good things. I want to tell you something. The, the other groups that do good things, if there were no Christians and no, no churches, the percentage of that is so small, it's almost non-existent. And most of them do good things out of some kind of a selfish motive. Even other religions to get to heaven, to make it to paradise, to get a better life the next afterlife. Christianity is the only religion that says, I'm going to do this because God has changed me. And it's in response to what he's already done, not to get something, not to earn something. What about education? Education would be set back 500 to 1,000 years without Christianity. Almost all colleges and universities before 1900 were started by the church in order to train pastors and missionaries. Every Ivy League school started that way. Look where they are now. Education for the working class, for the poor, for the disadvantaged, for minorities, for slaves, Christians. Speaking of slaves, where did the abolitionist movement come from? From Christian pulpits, from Christian books, from Christian churches. What brought the world out of the Dark Ages? A thousand years of barbarianism. Nothing but violence, paganism. So like the days of Noah. What, what changed the world from that to this culture of art and music and literature and information and enlightenment? It was the church. Because the printing press was invented. Why? To print the Bible. Because people were taught to read. Why? So they could read the Bible. And you could say, well, that would have eventually happened anyway. Somebody would have invented the printing press. Well, probably. Somewhere in China, it would have gotten invented, probably. For some other purpose. But without the light of the gospel, what dark forces would have ruled the world for eons? Pilgrims would have not come seeking freedom. Our founders wouldn't have had a foundation to write a declaration of independence based on the worth of the individual. Our framers would not have been able to write a constitution saying that our rights have been given to the individual by God and that governments exist to protect those rights. They would have known that. Almost every pillar of human goodness exists today, even in secular society, because of Christianity which only exists because of the resurrection. But I'm not teaching a comparative religions class this morning. Yes, the world is vastly different because Jesus rose again. Vastly different. And you can look to that and say that's evidence. But all that culture of change happened because people were changed individuals were changed when they put their faith in Christ. And when they put their faith in Christ, what did they put their faith into? That Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. And because of that, they were changed and changed people changed the world. Individual people who met a risen Savior. Peter was changed from a scaredy cat who denied the Lord three times. To a bold evangelist, 50 days later, 
filled with the Spirit, leading 5,000 plus people to Christ. Paul was changed when he met a risen Savior on the road to Damascus from a man who persecuted the church. Moses was changed. I didn't have him on my list, but he was. You want to jump a little bit further into our history? You ever come up behind a car at a stoplight and it says friend of Bill on the, on the, on the bumper sticker? Just ever seen that? Bill is the man who started Alcoholics Anonymous. He started Alcoholics Anonymous because one night, in desperation, in despair, the light of Christ flooded into his bedroom where he laid and he met Jesus. How many thousands, tens of thousands have been impacted because of his life? Watch the movie, Unbroken. That guy that was tortured by the Japanese goes and preaches to the Japanese war criminals after the... What changes a man like that? I could go on for hours, for days with descriptions and details of soldiers and statements and writers and evangelists and authors and artists who've been changed by the risen Christ. But what changed them? When Jesus died and rose again, things substantively and fundamentally changed in three realms. This physical world changed. The spirit realm was changed. And then the hearts of men were changed. Let's talk about the physical earth. Say, I'm not sure the physical earth was changed. (laughs) Anybody wake up with an ache or a pain this morning? (laughs) Or a sickness? This earth was made perfect, but it didn't take it very long to become corrupted. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, we know the story. The curse came. The curse came over all creation. Sin and death came. The world began to move towards death and has continued and is keeping on moving towards death from perfection to destruction and decay. The world moved from a place where every need was met in the Garden of Eden to a place of famine and poverty and thorns and weeds and drought. From perfect peace between the animal kingdom and between all men to violence and strife from perfect relationships between God and man and man and man to competition and hatred and prejudice and tribal warfare from working together in unity to stealing and murder from health to sickness from joy to pain now pastor are you going to tell me that when Christ arose that ended because when I pick up the newspaper when I turn on the television it doesn't seem like it has well it hasn't ended But something did change. It went from a world with no hope to a world with hope. Amen. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. This is talking about creation, the physical world. It says the creation waits in eager expectation. This cursed world made a big U-turn. It was headed for, 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 for no hope. And because Christ arose, it made a U-turn. And the kingdom hasn't come yet to earth. But it's coming! And, and it changed its trajectory from no hope to hope. The, the, the church is on the earth now doing our best with Christ's help and the Spirit of God to make to bring the kingdom on earth in full knowledge that it is going to come. Because Christ arose. We're not to the Garden of Eden yet, but we're headed there. And look what the, it says, the creation waits in eager, the, the birds get up this morning and they're singing. What are they singing about? That's what they're singing about. They want what we already have. Expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For creation was subjected to frustration. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it when the curse came. But it's in hope now. 
that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and be brought into the freedom and glory that we children of God already now have. We know that this physical world will be changed because of what Jesus did and the change that's already happened in the spirit realm. Number two. Before Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, before God raised him up and seated him in the heavenly realms and exalted him to the highest place, there was on earth and in the spirit realm a spiritual equation in place that Paul calls the law of sin and death. We were guilty. We were condemned. We were justly, spiritually dead in our trespasses and skins, sins and our skins. Every human being has sinned, did sin, kept sinning, will sin. Every human being has rebelled, will rebel, keeps rebelling. And there was nothing, there was no atonement that could pay our sin debt, the debt we owe. There was nothing that could fix it. Nothing that could reconcile a sinful man to a holy God. But God had a plan. And in His great mercy, in His great love, He implemented His plan. And after the flood, God chose a man named Abraham. And from him he built a nation of descendants to whom he began to reveal himself and to reveal his plan. A plan filled with foreshadows of blood sacrifices and a priesthood to mediate between God and man. An imperfect solution that was temporary. It was imperfect because it was implemented and affected by imperfect human beings. But in the fullness of time, Christ was born. Born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus came as a perfect man. Even though he was under that law, he never sinned. He was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. So that he could become the perfect sacrifice and the perfect priest. The one who could and did pay our sin debt on the cross. Who offered his body and his blood. For each and every person and each and every sin, now and forever, who finally made full atonement, who freely bore our guilt and our shame and our punishment out of his great love, and who offers to everyone, whosoever will, whosoever believeth, offers forgiveness and justification and eternal life. Before, before Jesus died and rose again, the devil could rightfully accuse every single person in this building and every single person in this world of sin. He could hold up the, the righteous law of God and point to it and then measure us against it and we would all fall short. But Jesus did not. He measured up. And because of it, he changed The spiritual landscape. Look at what Colossians 2 says. When we were dead in our sins and in the uncircumcision, out of covenant relationship, that's what that word means. When we were in our sins, we were dead in our sins, we were dead in our out of covenant relationship. God made us alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, this thing that the devil could point to and say we don't measure up, it stood against us and condemned it. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in the cross. Victory. Hebrews says the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You see, that when the devil pointed at the law, this was evidence of the fact that we could not be saved. We could not get to heaven. We are sinners. And that evidence spoke about our sin, just like the blood of Abel cried up from the ground about a murder. It was evidence. A murder has been committed, and there must be wrath. There must be punishment meted out 
on the guilty party. But the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. The blood of Jesus is that's, that's on the cross is also evidence. It's evidence of that something has happened. It's evidence that someone has paid the price for our sin. And the word that it speaks is not guilty, but innocent. Come on. He defeated the devil. He triumphed. He disarmed him. He defeated him. There is therefore now, now, since his death and resurrection, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the Spirit has set me free from that spiritual equation that I once labored under called the law of sin and death. Jesus did everything necessary to change the spirit realm and the spiritual rules. He changed darkness to light. He changed our guilt to justification. He changed the spiritual landscape. It was radically made over in an instant when the stone was rolled away. And the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Access to God was granted to everyone who believes. No more coming by way of an imperfect sacrifice. The the blood of a dead animal. No more fearfully coming by the way of an imperfect human intermediary. Now we come boldly before the throne. By a new and living way made through the curtain. His body. Not a dead animal sacrifice, but a living Christ. Whoever lives to make intercession for us. So all that's changed on this earth and all that's changed in the heavenly realms. But what's changed for you and I? Second Corinthians 5. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The new creation has come. The old has come, gone. The new is here. Everything's changed. You have been fundamentally changed. I have been fundamentally changed. If we're in Christ, we were objects of wrath. We were dead in our sins. We were separated from God. We were enemies of God. We were eternally doomed with no hope, with no standing, nothing to save us. We were blind. We were lost. But because Christ died and rose again, we've been made alive with Christ, raised to life with Him, given access to God, get grafted in to the covenant promises of Abraham, given standing. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. Jesus earned it. Adopted, accepted, loved, given a new family and a new purpose and a new identity from which flow new behaviors. The Bible says several ways to tell us that, that, that truth. It says we've been born again. Born again spiritually. Born again into a new family. Born again and given a new name. New names are kind of a big deal with God. Primarily because new names represent a new identity. And by identity, I mean a new way of thinking about yourself. Are you with me? I've been preaching a while and you kind of glazed over. (laughs) A new way of thinking about yourself. What's changed because Christ grows again? A new way of thinking about yourself. It's important. When God entered into a new relationship with Abram and Sarai, do you know what he did? He took the H out of his personal name, Yahweh, and he put it into their name. And he changed Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. You got the H. Did you get the H? Got the H. He put his name in them and he changed their names and he changed their identity. And when God changes somebody's name and changes their identity, it's usually coupled with a healing And a mission. And he gave both to them. They were childless, couldn't have children. He healed them and and they, they they became the parents of a child. And that child was the mission. The mission to build a new uncountable family that was going to take an unstoppable blessing to the whole world.
He made them partners in His plan. The weight of identity change in our life can't be overestimated. The importance of a new identity that brings new behaviors, how we live, how we walk, how we think, it comes from that new identity, how we see ourselves, because no person will consistently act in a manner that's inconsistent with what they think about themselves. And I'm not talking about positive thinking. I'm not talking about the power of positive thinking. I'm talking about accepting the change that God has wrought through His death and resurrection. If you think you're a jerk, you'll act like one. Eventually. Or stupid or lazy or worthless or incompetent. If that's what you believe, that's how you will act. If you think you're unlovable or unredeemable or irreparably broken... That's how you'll live. And everybody's got a past that speaks those words over us. Everybody. Three years ago in 2018, Lauren Dago came out with a single called You Say. It rocketed to number one and it stayed there for longer than any other single record has ever stayed at number one on any chart ever. And here's the lyrics, the opening lyrics to that song. I keep fighting voices in my head, in my mind, saying I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Every human can identify with those lyrics and the feelings that they represent. I'm talking about change here this morning. Because we've all sinned. We've all entered into a fallen world with a sin-broken identity. But it's precisely this kind of identity brokenness that Jesus came to save and change. He came to fix it. He came as the ultimate name changer. The ultimate miraculously conceived son to invite us into an uncountable family that's spreading an unstoppable blessing. The same family that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob got in. Our original names, our original identities are given to us in a number of ways. We start out in in some family of origin. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good. And they begin to speak words over us and and experience begins to speak words over us of who we are. Many of us are directly or indirectly, many if not most, if not all, scarred by abuse or abandonment or the withholding of love and acceptance or the crippling weight of negative comparisons or conditional love. And then the world begins to pile on. And teachers and coaches and romantic interests and bosses and peers and everybody else begins to tell us who we are and they begin to tell us who we are out of their own messed up sense of identity and they hold up a mirror to us and the image we see is ugly. And we don't like it. And we wish we could be like Superman and slide into a phone booth and change it, but we can't. And the devil whispers in our ear a convincing interpretation of all those things that neatly matches up with how we feel anyway. I feel unloved, so I'm unlovable. I feel rejected, so I deserve that. We're handed a false identity that's been manufactured by the world and our flesh and our devil and we, be, and we begin to live out of it or try to cover it up or both. Some of us cover it up with things that the world applauds like hard work and success and we be, try to become the very best we can be even though we hate what we're trying to cover up. Or we cover it up by being funny and sarcastic 
or we don't dive into addictions so to, to we, we don't feel the pain of it. But we're trying to deal with something that Jesus already dealt with. He came to destroy the devil's work. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the work of the evil one. And the evil one lies. He came to proclaim something. The very first sermon he, he preached, he was handed the scroll of Isaiah. And he opened it and he said, I have come to declare the Lord's favor. He was born in Bethlehem. The angels showed up and they announced something to some shepherds that amazed them. Something has happened tonight that has changed the identity equation. The Savior has come and brought goodwill to men. Christ wants us to know that we are not who the world says we are. We are not who the devil says we are. We're who Jesus says we are. In him, holy and dearly loved. You see, all that change that he made in the physical realm and all that change that he made in the spiritual realm is just generic generalities until it applies to me personally and specifically when I come to Christ. He's made it available to all, but it's given only to those who believe and receive. Have you? Have you believed? Have you received? Have you, have you believed it to the extent that you've taken a step of faith and done what the Lord says we've got to do to receive, which is humbly confess our sin, humbly confess we can't fix ourselves, and by faith receive what He did when He died on the cross and came out of the tomb. repenting of our sins putting our faith into Christ have you done that? now you may have believed everything I preached this morning all that physical realm stuff and all that spiritual realm theology stuff you may have believed all that but have you applied the blood to you by faith and if you have Are you still allowing the devil to tell you who you are? Are you still allowing the past to tell you who you are? Because if you are, you're not fully appropriating everything that Christ paid to give you. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to take a moment and answer that question to yourself honestly if you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior today I'm going to pray a prayer and I want you to pray with me I can't think of a better day in the history of the world to receive Jesus than today Pray something like this in your heart. Lord, I'm a sinner. Confess your sins. Lord, I'm a sinner. I've sinned many times. I knew it was wrong. I did it anyway. I know I've rebelled. I know I've sinned. And I know that you paid the price for it. I know that you died on that cross for me. And I know that on the third day, you rose again. And you proved that you could defeat death and hell in the grave. So right now, Lord, I'm saying I'm sorry. Say that to the Lord. Say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me of all my sin. Come into my heart and be my Savior. I give my life to you. You gave your life for me. I now give my life back to you. I don't know how long that's going to be. However long it is, I want to live for you. Say that to the Lord. Change me. Change me from the inside out. Change my heart. Change my desires. Change my identity. that will change my behavior. Right now, by faith, I receive you as my Savior. I receive that that gift that you paid to give, that you proved was real. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on that cross. In Jesus' name.
Amen. I want to pray one more prayer. For everybody who believes in Jesus, it's for everybody who is a Christian, but you've struggled with your identity. God wants you to live in an identity that's firmly rooted in His unconditional love for you. He doesn't love you because you deserve it. He loves you because He's a God of love and because you're in Christ. So pray this prayer with me. Lord, I reject I reject the, the words of the devil and my flesh and the world that tells me I am something else other than what you have said. And I receive by faith, just like I received my salvation, I receive this work that you want to do in me of changing my identity to who you say that I am. I'm your child. I'm holy and I'm dearly loved because of Jesus. And Lord, would you help me to appropriate, put that on, put on that new man and put off the old man, put to death the old man and walk in this new identity that you died and rose again to give me in Jesus' name. Amen.